Well, good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm John Cernelich, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Labor and Employment Department here at Kelsey Halter and Griswold. Thanks to everybody for joining us here this morning. It's kind of a damp, dreary morning here in Cleveland. Um, we're happy you're with us. We're really excited. You know, we planned these seminars, and we were all thrilled to see we have over 200 people registered. So uh, thank you for your interest. We hope we put together a presentation here this morning that will address some of the issues you're seeing um, as HR professionals, in-house counsel, and, and uh, management employees. Uh, we're going to talk generally about workplace issues 2020, and in particular, of course, about COVID, how that's been impacting the workplace. We're also going to talk about uh, some new NLRB decisions. Uh, Todd Palmer is going to take us through that. Those have to do with uh, possible disruptions in the workplace. And then Ray Tarasek will talk to us a little bit about Ohio's new law providing for immunity uh, for employers as to COVID-19 related lawsuits. During the morning, during the presentations, you'll be able to answer, ask some questions along the bottom of the Zoom. Um, please recognize that when you ask a question, um, all the participants will be able to see it's your question. Your name will be identified. Um, we welcome questions, and our speakers are going to try to answer those questions um, in writing if they can. Um, many of those, though, will probably uh, entail them having to talk a bit and, and talk about scenarios, and they'll be a little lengthy in their responses. So those kinds of questions we're going to try to save for the end. We're going to try to save about 15 minutes at the end to answer your questions. So thanks very much. We appreciate you being here. Uh, we're very grateful for our clients and friends. We're going to start this morning with senior counsel Jennifer Colvin. Jen is in our Cincinnati office, and she's one of the leaders in the clubhouse uh, in terms of our lawyers in addressing COVID-19 issues. And she's going to talk this morning about um, recurring issues about COVID-19. So um, hopefully we'll stay on track. And again, thank you, everyone. Here's Jen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, as John mentioned, I'm going to talk about recurring issues managing um, COVID in the workplace. We'll start with some best practices for returning to work. And I know we'll do that briefly. I know a lot of you have already returned to the office. Um, we'll move into managing employees and the physical workspaces when someone in your, work, in your workplace is positive or presumed positive for COVID-19. And then how to manage the different benefits that we've seen come into play when you have either employees who have been affected by the COVID-19 virus or um, submitting other requests based on whether it's uh, children out of school or even other illnesses, right? They don't stop simply because we're in a pandemic. Um, so goals of returning to work, like I said, we'll touch on this briefly. I mean, I think when we're bringing people back into the office, the goal is, the first one is to prevent and reduce the risk of transmission of the virus. And that's, that's key as a baseline. Um, we also want to get back to do the business of the business, right? Reopening and um, getting back to what you normally do. Minimizing risk of liability. And um, Ray will talk a little bit about that. There's been some developments there at the end of our presentation. And then positive employee relations. And I think there's really an opportunity here as you return in person or reopen that the way you do it can actually benefit the company and increase um, positive employee goodwill. So best practices for returning to work, have a plan. And we're talking about developing a detailed written plan. Um, you know, really think through all the different uh, components of bringing people back into your workspace and each workspace is gonna be different. Are you a multi-level um, high-rise building with many tenants? Are you your own physical facility? A lot of these considerations change based on um, your individual characteristics. And a written plan will help you respond to any type of inquiry from the Department of Health or OSHA. And it gives intentionality to the process. Uh, I've seen a lot of clients walk the building, walk the floors, finding the uh, choke points where you think really it's gonna be difficult for employees to stay distanced. Um, it gives some real intentionality to bringing people back into the building. Uh, elements to include in your written return to work plan. Uh, certainly, these are things you can consider. Not everyone is going to do these the same way, and not everyone is necessarily going to include every consideration. But things to consider would be temperature and system screenings, and this would be upon entry. The goal not being any, not being um, 
to let anyone into your building who is positive for either uh, fever or symptoms of COVID-19. Face coverings and, uh, you know, employers have addressed this in a lot of different ways, but thinking about how you're going to mandate, require face coverings be worn, where they'll be worn, um, and whether there are any safety considerations. Um, there are certain positions where it's really not advisable, it's not safe to, to wear coverings or, or cloth over your face um, during the, the job functions. Social distancing, how you're going to enable employees to stay distanced in the workplace. Cleaning, disinfection, and ventilation. And when we're talking about cleaning and disinfection, we're, we're talking about enhanced cleaning procedures. Getting those touch points. Um, where are people congregating or where are high use, high traffic areas? Uh, ventilation, can we increase ventilation? And this is gonna be especially important as you come into the winter months. Can we increase the exchange of fresh air in our building? Um, travel, I've helped a number of employers uh, create a new pandemic travel policy. And so thinking about what are customer needs and what are just really practices that have been normal in non-pandemic times. And then exceptions to return. Not everyone's going to feel comfortable and not everyone really is advised to return to in-person settings at this point. So, so considering each case individually and, and creating a practice, a plan for how you're going to handle exceptions. Um, so managing COVID cases in the workplace. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to address is when employees should be asked to stay home. And hopefully uh, if, if you're doing um, the entry screening, you know, hopefully no one ever gets through your doors, but it's possible that someone might, and then it's also possible that someone calls and asks you, well, should I come to work today? So employees should be asked to stay home, certainly if they have a positive test for COVID-19, if they're presumed positive for COVID-19. So say they, um, you know, live around, they live with someone who is a frontline healthcare worker and they started having a few symptoms. Um, you know, there are certain instances where you could presume a positive case before a test. Um, exposure to COVID-19, and there's a new test for the CDC here. So exposure is now, as of last week, exposure is um, close contact, which is within six feet, mask or no mask, for 15 minutes or more. Um, and now that's cumulative exposure over the last 24 hours. So it used to be that exposure was a contact with someone for 15 minutes or more. Now it's a cumulative test. So it, it's harder to administer. Um, and it did change last week. And then if anyone has symptoms of COVID-19. So this is someone, an employee who doesn't think they've ever been around anyone who has COVID-19 but all of a sudden they have a cough or shortness of breath, or actually I've seen quite a bit of um, loss of taste and smell. Uh, and it's a pretty innocuous symptom for those individuals, but it's, it's pretty specific to COVID-19. Those employees should be, asked to be, to, should be asked to stay home. Um, how long should an employee be asked to stay home? Generally, anyone who is exposed to COVID-19 um, should isolate at home for 14 days. This is, you now different tests, and we'll get to that next, if someone is actually positive, right, or has symptoms and is, has a positive test or is presumed positive. But if someone is exposed, they should be asked to self-isolate for 14 days at home. Um, if someone has symptoms that, and we've come across this quite a bit, that could be COVID or something else, um, allergies, something like that, then uh, you, can re you can have them stay home and return to work with a, a positive diagnosis of some other um, uh, illness or, or allergy is something that is not COVID-19. But generally, if someone has symptoms of COVID-19 or they think they've been exposed, uh, they should self-isolate for 14 days unless they pass one of the return to work tests. So approved return to work methodologies, there are three, and these are for individuals who are uh, positive, either a positive test or presumed positive. We're treating them as if they have COVID-19. Um, the symptoms-based strategy is the most common and the easiest to administer. Uh, the person returning to work has to be 24 hours without a fever, unmedicated, um, and then other symptoms are improving. The CDC is no longer mandating or requiring that symptoms be absent, but symptoms are improving, and then they are at least 10 days since the symptoms first appeared. So if someone 
had their first symptom 10 days ago and they haven't had a fever for 24 hours and you're more than 10 days, 10 days or more from the first symptoms and their other symptoms are improving, um, say their cough is getting better, uh, they feel like they can breathe much better, everything is improving, then those individuals can return to work under the symptoms-based strategy. Um, the CDC has clarified that loss of taste or smell that persists for a, a long period of time should not be used as a reason to keep someone out of the workplace or out of other settings. <clears throat> it just seems like there are a few symptoms that do persist for, for much longer than 10 days. Um, and they've determined that's not necessarily indicative of uh, being able to pass the virus to someone else. Time-based strategy. This is for someone who's asymptomatic but has a positive test. So they have a positive COVID test, but they never had symptoms. How do you calculate when they come back to work? It's at least 10 days since the confirmed test. And again, no symptoms. If someone develops symptoms, you're back to the symptoms-based strategy. The test-based strategy is the third. This one has become disfavored over the last week or so with the CDC. Um, so this would be used as a last resort. Someone who's asymptomatic and test positive, then um, they are able to return to work or other activities if there are two negative test results collected at least 24 hours apart that are consecutive negative results um, and respiratory specimens. I, you know, I, I, again, I think this one is, is less, uh, less favored certainly than um, the other two tests. So use it only as a last resort. Um, so how are other employees affected? If you have, and like we said, hopefully you're catching people at the door, that doesn't always happen. So if someone was in your workplace and is now positive for COVID-19, if they were not in the workplace within seven days prior to either having symptoms or the positive test, then there's really nothing additional you need to do. Um, no additional disinfection measures, uh, you know, continue with your enhanced cleaning protocols that you've hopefully been doing in accordance with your return to work plan. If your COVID positive employee was in the workplace, um, or was not in the workplace in the prior 48 hours, then no one at work has been exposed, right? So you're not, you're not really affecting other employees. However, for the workspace, you should uh, use additional sanitization and cleaning efforts to especially sanitize and disinfect the area where that employee may have been or any common areas. Um, if the COVID positive employee was in the workplace while presumed contagious, and this is 48 hours prior to either a positive test or 48 hours prior to experiencing symptoms, then you need to engage in that contact tracing activity, notifying potentially exposed employees and asking anyone exposed to self-isolate at home for 14 days. Um, it's In the past, our, our advice really has been, hey, you can notify employees who are exposed but you have to be aware of confidentiality and, and not disclosing the name of the affected employee, the, the employee who tested positive. Um, with the new CDC test, that becomes really an administrative nightmare to try to contact trace when you're trying to figure out whether someone has been around this affected individual for a cumulative 15 minutes over the past 24 hours um, or even, you know, kind of some type of 24 hour period within the last 48 hours that they were in work. So um, there is an alternative that, that you can use to, to ask the affected employee um, to either, you know, kind of waive their confidentiality with respect to disclosing their name or their identity, um, you know, asking if they're okay with you using their identity to contact Trace. Um, something to consider, and we really haven't seen how this is gonna play out. Confidentiality obviously is paramount when you're talking about medical considerations, but um, there's a real difference here with how we're gonna be able to, con to contact Trace. So a little hypothetical, and I'm trying to be mindful of time. So there's a few in here, we've included them in the written materials. Um, John is an employee in your accounting group. He attends a backyard barbecue. And by the way, this is where we're seeing the spread, social activities, on a Saturday. Comes to work on a Monday, works regular business hours. On Monday, he finds out that one of his friends tested positive for COVID. He has no symptoms. So who's affected here and what do you do? You just kind of unpack it, right? John has no symptoms and John is not having a positive test for COVID. 
So within the past 48 hours, on that Monday, he was at work. He has not exposed anyone to COVID-19. He doesn't have COVID-19 um, and he has no symptoms. So no employees in the workplace will have necessarily been exposed. Obviously, ask John to keep in touch and, and let you know if he develops any symptoms. Um, but if he shows no symptoms and does not have a positive test by Wednesday, then your, your employees aren't going to be affected. Um, John will be affected because John will now need to self-isolate at home for 14 days. Um, he has certainly been exposed to his friend if he said, you know, socialized with him. So if he spent 15 minutes or more over the course of the barbecue with this person, then he's been exposed and needs to stay home. Um, Hypothetical A1, just a quick note, this is totally different for critical infrastructure employees. So if John is um, a nurse in an emergency room, then an exposed critical infrastructure employee is permitted to continue working so long as they carefully monitor for symptoms, the employer uses some additional um, safety measures, and, and the employee has no symptoms, asymptomatic. So a little bit different, and obviously we're here for questions for anyone who is critical infrastructure, but just wanted to mention that. Um, hypothetical B, Jane is an employee in inside sales. She attends a family birthday party on Sunday. She comes to work and works Monday through Friday. On Friday afternoon, this would be typical, five, five to six days after exposure, she loses her sense of smell on a Friday night, um, and she, on Friday afternoon, and she uh, loses her sense of smell on Friday night. She is able to get a COVID test on Saturday and gets a positive result Monday morning, October 26th. So what do you do with Jane? Well, first, hopefully you have a written plan. And as soon as Jane started coughing on Friday afternoon, you sent her home, right? So hopefully uh, you minimized exposure in that way. Um, since Jane is now positive for COVID-19, you will need to determine who has been exposed to her. So using the new CDC rule, you're looking at who was within six feet of Jane, and this is masked or unmasked, for 15 minutes cumulatively over 24 hours, uh, and you trace 48 hours from the beginning of symptoms, not from the positive test. So you're, you're going to look at who Jane was in close contact with on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Um, it's difficult. It's a difficult test. And, and uh, like I said, I've helped a lot of employers through this because of it's, it's very technical. Um, so all exposed employees need to be asked to isolate and work from home for 14 days. So employees who were exposed, say on the last day she was at work, Friday, are going to be asked to isolate at home until Friday, November 6th. It's a long time. Um, it's really important, this highlights how important it is to know where employees are in the building, how they're working in proximity to one another, and then how they're moving throughout the building, especially in common spaces. Now, what about Jane? Well, Jane can come back to work 10 days after she develops symptoms, as long as she is 24 hours fever-free with improving symptoms. So Jane, as long as she meets those requirements, uh, can come back to work on Monday, November 2nd. So I mentioned that because it's a little counterintuitive. The positive employee who actually was affected can come back to work before the employees who are self-isolating because they were exposed. So watch for that. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to employees. We get a lot of questions. So the benefits that have been implicated. Obviously, the new uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act um, paid emergency sick leave for two, up to two weeks, 80 hours, and then expanded family medical leave, um, and this is only for care of a child whose school or daycare is closed or unavailable. Um, and, and these are, and those are paid. Traditional FMLA, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot going on with COVID that's been implicated with COVID and then with other conditions that persist. Um, there's, it's unpaid leave for illness of an employee, say, you know, if you're a COVID long hauler, um, you, you could end up needing FMLA for a period of time to recover um, or leave to care for illness of others. And this could be COVID or other illnesses. And then the interplay with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, you know, again, co there's, there's this group of COVID long haulers. Uh, query whether it, it rises to the level of a disability, it might. So there's going to be COVID implications with the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's also um, going to be considerations related to whether someone with an existing condition um, now is considered disabled, maybe when they weren't pre-pandemic, 
whether it's because of the risks or uh, they're unable to wear a mask or other, other considerations. So the, we've seen the ADA certainly come into play here. Um, uh, you know, I want to mention there are generally in Ohio, there is a requirement under the, the Stay Safe Ohio order that requires employees to wear face masks. Um, we, we get a lot of questions about, well, someone doesn't want to wear a face mask or they were wearing a face mask and now they've said they're unable to. Um, that's going to be, uh, we're considering that kind of, you know, best practices to follow the ADA inquiry, right? If there is now a condition, let's find out what are the functional limitations of this condition? What are the physical limitations that are, that are being brought to you? Um, and do they really justify not wearing a mask, right? A face covering. Um, if you find, yes, okay, the doctor's order says, hey, it does, and, and, and this is where we are now in the pandemic, um, then I think the second prong is that reasonableness prong and looking at is it reasonable to excuse the face covering requirement? Because if this person works within six feet of others, then it's probably not. So, um, so considering that reasonableness underpinning of uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Hypothetical C, um, Tommy requests expanded FMLA to be home with his school-aged children, Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays. They have a hybrid learning schedule where they're only allowed in person two days a week. Is it permissible and what do you have to pay? Um, yes, it's permissible and it's not considered intermittent. This is going to be um, really leave as of right under the FFCRA and he must be paid up to two thirds of his pay up to the limits of the statute. Um, note that this would only, he would only get paid leave if he's unable to work or telework. So again, a lot of these may be, um, we may be able to resolve them with uh, telework. So um, okay, same hypothetical, except one of his children tests positive for COVID-19 and now he requests continuous leave to care for his child. Is he entitled to leave and what do you have to pay him? Um, so now it's important to look at that emergency paid sick leave portion because that's broader than, um, than leave for care of children for school and daycare closures. So if, if Tommy has not exhausted paid sick leave, then that leave would cover someone who either is suffering symptoms, care for someone who's suffering symptoms of COVID or has been directed to isolate or quarantine because of COVID-19. So he would be entitled to the paid sick leave portion up to two weeks. Um, and if it's, for, if it's for care of someone who actually has symptoms or is quarantining, then that paid leave is, is full pay. Um, if, so if emergency paid sick leave has been exhausted, then this becomes care for someone who is ill under regular FMLA. And I, I just wanna note here that the FFCRA is much broader and applies to many more employees than regular FMLA. So if you didn't have to comply with FMLA prior to the FFCRA, then a request to care for someone over a long period of time, even if it's COVID, is gonna be um, coming under the regular FMLA. And so it may not apply to Tommy. Um, but but those, those are the considerations you'd wanna take into account here. It shifts a little bit, even though he is already approved for that FFCRA for care of his children. Um, slightly different, uh, one of his children has a severe broken leg requiring multiple um, treatments and a surgery. He requests continuously for four weeks. Well, now COVID isn't, implicated at all. And so you're not looking at the paid emergency sick leave, right? Um, that really applies to COVID related pieces. So here it, he is requesting traditional FMLA. And again, the considerations are, is the employer covered, FMLA covered, FMLA employer? And if so, then FMLA can be granted and used um, and it will be unpaid. So, the next two slides, we've included them in your written materials. I'm not going to go over them, but we've included some sources of guidance, which we thought were particularly useful and helpful as a reference. Um, so those are in there. And I will introduce Jason DeHalo, who is going to be our next presenter, and uh, uh, turn it over to Jason. So good morning. Um, with, uh, with various clinical trials currently well underway, 
the availability of a COVID vaccine now is not so much a matter of if, but a matter of when. So naturally, employers are beginning to ask the question, and I, th I think it's fair to ask the question and consider it now, can we require our employees as a condition of, empl uh, of employment to get the COVID vaccine when one becomes available? So I guess we can just cut to the chase. Are employer mandatory vaccination policies legal? And with regard to vaccinations generally, the answer is yes, uh, but with an asterisk. And we know this because um, mandatory vaccinations in the, in the workplace, while um, not common, are not new. And some law and guidance on this issue has developed primarily in the last 10 years regarding um, mandatory flu vaccination policies. So what about mandatory COVID um, vaccination policies? Again, I think the, the likely answer is going to be yes, you can do them, but again, with an asterisk. And, and I say likely because that, that law that has developed um, in the last decade has mainly centered around the healthcare industry and healthcare workers who work with um, sick patients, many of them elderly, who are most susceptible to a uh, high risk of severe complications um, from the flu. Um, and even then, most hospitals did not mandate flu vaccinations right away until decades after the vaccine was developed and only after it had been shown over the years to be a safe and effective way to, to prevent the flu. And still even today, the vast majority of employers don't mandate flu vaccinations, they simply offer it on a voluntary basis and encourage employees um, to get vaccinated. So how that law applies to employers in other settings outside of healthcare, for example, in manufacturing, in um, office settings, and, and during a, a pandemic such as this it, uh, remains to be seen. But I think it's fair to conclude that that same legal framework will apply here so why the asterisk? And I, I think the, the better answer is yes with a whole series of asterisks or caveats because even if an employer has a mandatory vaccination policy, um, employers are still required to, to make certain exemptions for some employees um, from that mandate uh, under certain circumstances, and we'll talk about those. There, there are also a ho whole host of other laws that might impact how employers can implement and enforce the policy, and um, not to mention the practical considerations in mandating a vaccination for your workforce. Um, but before we get to that, what, what are the benefits of a vaccinated workforce? And, and this is regardless of whether you as the employer decide to mandate it or just offer and encourage vaccination for your employees. And many of these are pretty obvious, so I'm not going to run through um, each of them. Um, but you can expect there to be fewer um, absences because employees are healthier. Um, and the families and in, in their in persons in their household who they may have to miss work to care for are will be healthier too. Um, you can expect fewer disruptions associated with um, infection control measures such as deep cleaning when an employee gets COVID and potentially exposes others, uh, other employees to, to COVID. Uh, employees uh, eventually will be able to, to travel more and uh, visit and service customers and have more face-to-face -face interactions without fear of becoming ill or getting others ill. And I think um, while less obvious but no less important, I think it can't be understated um, the mental health benefits of knowing that the workforce is vaccinated as anxieties for both the employer charged with uh, keeping employees safe and employees we have to come into work during a pandemic is, is very real. Um, probably most importantly, it, it not only protects that individual, but protects his or her coworkers, 
customers, visitors who come on site and, and their families. And so I think regardless of whether you choose to mandate uh, vaccination or not, I think these are the types of benefits that should, can and should be communicated to employees when you promulgate your po policy to get them to, to buy into getting vaccinated. So having considered those benefits, you might say to yourself, then we, we should mandate vaccination as soon as possible, right? Well, the answer is not that simple. Um, so let's talk about where we are today. Um, over 170 potential vaccines are being developed worldwide, five of which are, and this is actually four, one is, is coming up shortly, are currently in phase three clinical trials in the U.S. We know that the FDA has, is requiring that the vaccine be shown to be at least 50% effective, although how much um, above 50%? Is it 60, 70, 80%? Um, well, a vaccine that has been approved, how effective that will be, we don't yet know. We also know that er earlier this month, the FDA has, has issued guidance saying that it, it wants uh, companies to, to wait until they uh, can provide two months of safety data after their phase three trials conclude um, to include that data in their application for approval. So we're really looking at um, December probably uh, until we get approval for a vaccine and, and it can start to be, be rolled out. Um, and that's going to happen in phases. The Ohio Department of Health uh, just last week uh, published its, its four phase plan to distribute the vaccine. And the first phase is going to focus on he uh, healthcare workers, uh, first responders and those uh, higher risk populations. And, and the vast majority of people are going to be um, in that last phase, that phase, the fourth phase. So there's still a lot of unknowns as to how and when, uh, how effective it'll be, when it'll become available generally to the, to the public, um, how frequently someone has to take it. We know that most um, vaccines that are on, in trial right now require two doses. We don't know whether it's gonna be an annual vaccine like uh, the flu vaccine, or if it's just a one-time thing. And then we still don't yet know the potential side effects. And we, and we probably won't know that until um, the vaccine gets FDA approval and the side effects are announced. But I think probably the biggest obstacle um, to mandatory vaccination is whether employees and Americans in general are willing to get the vaccine if one is approved. And here, I think the main concern is the, the development speed and safety of, of a new vaccine. And perhaps, you know, calling this, uh, the process Operation Warp Speed um, may not have been the, the best choice of name because what we see in um, recent Gallup polls, and this came out just this month, Americans' willingness is, is decreasing. It, it's fallen from 66% uh, in July, and that percentage was higher um, to about 70% in April. And currently, about half of Americans say that the, they would be willing to get it now if the FDA approved a vaccine. Um, that percentage decreases for uh, older adults. Um, women are less, more, uh, it's about 44%, less than half of the women polled say they will be willing to, to, to get a vaccine. Um, and parents who have children under the age of 18 um, show that they're not as willing to, to get vaccinated. So there's a fairly sizable proportion of the population who, if a, a vaccine were approved now and it were offered, uh, would be hesitant to get it. So you're probably asking, you know, can't the government just mandate it? And then I, I think that it, this has been 
a view shared by a lot of employers rather than, you know, taking the approach of just recommending, just tell us what we need to do or what we, we can do and, and we'll do it. I think a federal mandate is not going to happen. Um, Dr. Fauci just recently said it, it's never in the history of America been mandated in, in terms of a, a vaccination and it's not going to happen on a nationwide scale. Now, it, it may at the state and local level, but I, it's very unlikely that they're going to mandate it for everyone. I, I, I think you, you can pretty much say that they're not going to. Um, and that any government mandate is going to be um, specific to certain industries. So uh, healthcare, nursing homes, uh, possibly schools, um, meat packing plants, um, those type of industries. And the, the majority then is going to fall on whether um, just the general population decides to get it on their own or whether employers offer or mandate um, vaccination policies. So back to the asterisk, I think there are, well, there are two principal exemptions. One under the ADA, if an employee has a medical condition that qualifies as a disability that prevents him or her from safely receiving the vaccine. And the other is Title VII's prohibition against religious discrimination. If an employee objects to receiving a vaccine based on sincerely held religious beliefs, practice, or observance. Again, until now, it's been uh, mandatory vaccination policies have mostly been limited to the healthcare industry, but as you can see, um, based on another Gallup poll last year, mandating it has increased coverage. Almost 45% of healthcare workers said their employers require the flu shot, and of those employers, 98% uh, of employees got vaccinated. And this compared to 90%, I think, uh, for in general in the healthcare industry. Healthcare industry, they're pretty good about getting va uh, vaccinated. But um, I think with regard to the general public and other uh, workplaces, I think you can expect that that percentage to be a lot lower. So the exemption for uh, medical uh, or con reasons, um, I think that the key thing here is that we, we don't yet know the components of an improved vaccine or any medical contraindications. So we're probably going to have to wait until after FDA approval to establish the protocol for a medical exemption. I will note, note that for the flu vaccine, at least, there, there are very few conditions that are medical contraindications. It's really just a severe um, allergy to eggs. And this is more than just a sensitivity or um, more than, you know, hives. Um, and then Guillain-Barre syn uh, syndrome, which is an autoimmune disorder. If, if you take the, the vaccine, it could lead to risks of paralysis or death. But um, with regard to the religious exemption, I think you can, you know, prepare right now um, as to how that would apply. And here it's important to note that um, employers must provide an exemption absent uh, undue hardship. And undue hardship for purposes of a religious accommodation is a, a lower standard than under the ADA. It's more than a de minimis cost to the operation of the employer's business. But um, I think since we're all wearing masks, one of the, one of the accommodations for people who are, have been exempted from a va vaccination policy, whether it be medical or a religious, is that they um, be required to wear a mask um, while at work. So, I mean, we're doing this anyway. So I think the undue hardship um, standard may not come into play here with regard to the COVID vaccine. Um, what has been at issue is whether um, a, a position or opposition to vaccine is a sincerely held religious belief. I think a lot of opposition to vaccination is sincerely held. The question is, is it a religious belief? 
And I, I cited to a recent Third Circuit case that, that issued a three-part test um, to determining whether a belief, a sincerely held belief, is religious. And it talks about what constitutes a religion. And I think the most important thing is that it, it's really a comprehensive system of beliefs, not just an isolated teaching. Um, you know, not, in that case, it, the court held that uh, opposition or just worries about the health effects of a vaccine, a disbelief of, of the science that taking the vaccine is safe. It, it's, it was a flu vaccine in that case or just wishing to avoid the vaccine is, is not enough. Um, and even just a, a, a belief that one should not harm one, uh, their own body, that's more of an isolated position rather than a comprehensive system of beliefs um, to, to show that it, it's based on uh, religion. Um, formal and external signs to look at, you know, things like formal services, the existence of clergy, formal structure and organization, observance of religious holidays as uh, associated with traditional religions. But be aware that, that some courts, in, including there's a, a decision in the Southern District of Ohio that held that veganism can rise to the level of a, a religious belief, at least enough to survive a, a motion to dismiss at the beginning of a lawsuit. Um, but some courts in the EOC have, have interpreted religion more broadly in the context of mandatory vaccination policies. I think what has been established is that oppo uh, opposition to vaccination um, for personal or secular or political philosophical, philosophical reasons are not enough um, to constitute a sincerely held religious belief. The EOC has also issued guidance on this, um, citing to the, the medical and religious exemption. Um, they first issued a guidance in 2009 during the swine flu outbreak. And in that case, they, they simply uh, inc recommended that employers encourage employees rather than require them. And this was due to a concern of potential discrimination based on disability or, or religion. They updated this um, in, in 2020 in response to the pandemic. Um, but as of, uh, they, they simply just pointed out the self-evident fact that as of that, the date of that update, there is no vaccine available. Um, the one helpful thing they did do is they acknowledged that the COVID pandemic meets the ADA's direct threat standard, specifically if um, employees who uh, ha have COVID or have symptoms of COVID enter the workplace. So they allow for more um, extensive medical inquiries and, and controls than typ typical um, in the absence of a pandemic, things like temperature and symptom screening, even um, on-site COVID testing, um, although not antibody testing. So I think that might give you a hint at where, what they, they might view I, I think it's likely that they're going to say mandatory vaccination policies are permissible, but they're still going to uh, recommend that employers simply encourage employees rather than require it. The, e uh, the OSHA takes a similar view, um, but they um, did know in 2009 during the swine flu outbreak that employees who refuse vaccination because of a reasonable belief that he or she has a medical condition that creates a real danger of serious illness or death, such as a serious reaction to the vaccine, may be protected from retaliation under 11C of OSHA, which is their whistleblower statute. There, there is no private cause of action, but um, they can bring a complaint to OSHA and OSHA um, could investigate it. I think it's, it's notable that OSHA is actively encouraging its inspectors to get uh, the COVID vac vaccination when it becomes available. So uh, likely the OSHA is going to say, yes, again, you can mandate it provided you, provi you give ex those exemptions, but um, employers should, employer should um, encourage it rather than mandate it. 
other considerations, um, if an employee has an, an adverse reaction to the vaccine, that could still have uh, potential workers' comp claims. Ray's going to talk about the um, Ohio's new immunity law, but that doesn't really address workers' comp claims for employees. If you have a union-represented workforce, um, likely going to have to negotiate with the union. Now, most unions um, aren't going to like uh, having employees be disciplined or potentially terminated if those, those employees uh, refuse a vaccine. But I don't think unions generally are, are opposed to vaccination itself. Um, be aware of like uh, employees who talk ab amongst themselves uh, about the, va the vaccination policy or uh, gather together and oppose a mandatory vaccination policy that can be uh, protected under the NLRA and, and, and lead to an unfair labor practice charge if employers were to discipline based on that conduct. Again, you can expect some opposition and exemption requests. I mean, if you just look at how um, difficult it is to, to mandate masks, um, and especially in light of the anti-vaccination movement um, that is, is, is happening today. Um, but also keep in mind that the, a vaccine's not going to be a fail-safe, uh, you know, way to provide a safe work environment. And that for a period of time, employers are, are likely going to have to continue the safety protocols, mask wearing, distancing, um, even after a vaccine has been approved and becomes widely available. I'm, I'm running short on time, but um, so I'm gonna run through this, but it's in, it's in your materials. What's right for your workplace? Again, you can mandate with those two exemptions. Some may decide that a hybrid approach, mandating it for some employees who, you know, for example, work with high risk individuals or work in environments where it's difficult to distance um, should get, be required to get the, the, the vaccine, but other employees, for example, those who work in offices, uh, that where you can shut the door, don't need to get the vaccine. Um, you can offer the, vac the vaccine to employees, again, on a voluntary basis and encourage employees to get vaccinated. And I think this is probably where most employers are going to land, um, given that we don't know how effective the vaccine is. We don't know how many um, people are going to get the vaccine and, and we're going to have to continue um, those safety measures and mask wearing for a period of time anyway. Options if you mandate employees are exempt. Again, this might just begin and end with continuing to wear masks, but the, the considerations would be all the other considerations that you would, you would uh, consider when an employee requests an accommodation. Um, and just as you've probably been doing during this, this pandemic. Um, best practices, I think the one thing I wanna point out is that you wanna give enough time uh, in advance to notify employees of the policy. You wanna provide a deadline for requesting the exemption and have separate exemption request forms, one for medical and one for religious and then have a later deadline for getting uh, vaccinated and allow for time to consider and, and enter into that interactive process for those who request an exemption. Um, and typically it's about two month, a two month period um, between notifying employees of a policy and the deadline for getting vaccinated with time in between to submit the, the re exemption request and make a determination. Um, the vaccination should be free of charge uh, and consider, if possible, making them available on site. If that's not possible and employees have to go to like a pharmacy to get the, the vaccine, um, keep, you can consider keeping them or I would recommend keep, keeping them on the clock. You can consider um, providing a PTO for that day. Um, 
One other thing I, th I think is to, to educate employees. You can have a, a webinar for your employees about the safety and benefits of vaccination. The CDC does have a website um, on promoting vaccination in the workplace that can give you some helpful ideas. Um, and that's with regard to the flu vaccine, but I think it's just as applicable here. And last, I mean, just like anything that employers have had to do during this pandemic, you want to monitor um, the law and, and guidance for more answers and just continue to um, adapt to this changing situation. And uh, as more um, people become more comfortable with the prospect of, of getting a vaccine. So now I'm going to um, switch it over to, to Todd and he's going to give the NLRB update. Uh, thank you, you Jason. Uh, all right. Uh, let's. Uh, sorry, let me uh, get my, my slideshow going here. My mouse is not cooperating. Uh, here we go. All right. Well, as, as many of you know, uh, and it goes without saying, 2020 has, has been the year of the unforeseen and the unpredictable, uh, and, and it's not over yet. We still have two months to go, um, and who knows what may happen uh, in the next 60 days or, or indeed even beyond into, into the new year. Uh, but some of the forces and movements which have been impacting our country in 2020 uh, could, could very well play out in the workplace. Uh, and so uh, with that in mind, uh, we, we've done some thinking about uh, possible uh, uh, ways that, that your workforce uh, could be disrupted in the coming months uh, and, and how those disruptions uh, are treated under the National Labor Relations Act. Um, now, just as... as uh, to cover some fundamentals, um, and, and, and Jason uh, mentioned it with respect to a, a, a vaccine policy, uh, uh, but, but one of the, the bread, bedrock principles of labor law uh, is something called pr protected concerted activity, and that arises under Section 7 of the NLRA. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. We, we can't see your second slide. Aha. Uh -huh. Uh, all right, let me, is that better? No, if you want me to, I can share my screen really quick and get it up okay. there and you can just direct me. Uh, yes, please. Okay, go ahead and click stop share and I'll get yours up. Okay, um, I'm, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, let's see, stop share. Okay, all right. Okay. Give me one second and I'll get it up. All right, thank you, Maggie. No problem. Um, but yes, um, uh, uh, Section 7 grants to employees the right to self-organization. Uh, in other words, to form and join and assist uh, labor organizations or, or to bargain collectively uh, through representatives uh, and also to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining and other mutual aid or protection. Um, the important takeaway from this is that Section 7 rights extend to all employees, union and non-union alike. Uh, one, of, one of the greatest myths uh, that, that I hear from time to time uh, is, is from uh, non-union employers who say, oh, that, that National Labor Relations Act, that doesn't apply to me because I don't have a union. Uh, that, is a, that is a false myth. It applies to all employers. Uh, so, I'm sorry, next slide, please. Um, let's just unpack a couple key concepts uh, within this definition of pr protected concerted activity, and the first is concerted activity. Uh, that occurs when two or more employees act together 
to address their terms and conditions of employment. Uh, it requires a, a linkage to group action, um, you know, some type of a group concern or activity engaged in on behalf of others uh, or, or initiating or preparing for group action. Uh, it can be solo action by a single employee, but if it's being done on behalf of a group or on behalf of a group concern, uh, it's protected. Now, the other key concept in protected concerted activity is, is mutual aid or protection. Uh, the activity must relate to the employee's terms and conditions of employment. Uh, and terms and conditions of employment is a very broad concept. It's, it encompasses everything from wages and hours to benefits to, uh, you know, the price of soda in the, uh, in, in the vending machine in the employee break room. Um, but, the, but the focus of mutual aid or protection uh, is whether employees are, are seeking to improve their lot as employees. Um, next, please. Um, and so uh, that brings us to the first variety of disruption uh, that, that, that uh, we're seeing some of so far in 2020, but we may certainly see as, as COVID uh, continues to flare and those are safety-related work stoppages. This is an issue on which the law differentiates between union and non-union employees. Uh, with respect to non-union employees, uh, the National Labor Relations Board, that's the agency that enforces the National Labor Relations Act, uh, the board says that Section 7 protects employees when they take collective action, that is work stoppages or strikes, to protest what they believe to be unsafe or unhealthy conditions. Uh, now, the employee must have a, a reasonable good faith belief that working under certain conditions is unsafe. Uh, importantly, the employees don't have to be right to be protected under Section 7. Uh, they can be honestly mistaken, uh, or the employer may disagree with them and deem that, that the disputed conditions are safe. Uh, but, but regardless, uh, so long as there's a reasonable good faith belief, the employees are protected. Uh, now, uh, let, let's look at the next uh, example or the next uh, set of rules uh, for safety related work stoppages, which involve uh, union employees. And that's, that's on the next slide, Maggie. Thank you. Um, uh, union employees are, are governed by a, a slightly different uh, statutory provision. It's Section 502 of uh, the, the Labor Management Relations Act, which uh, was actually a, a 1947 amendment to the National Labor Relations Act. And, and uh, I, I'm trying to avoid a lot of the esoterica of labor law. And believe you me, there is, there is abundant esoterica. Uh, but uh, un under the Section 502, which governs union employees, a refusal to work over safety conditions is protected if the work is abnormally dangerous. Uh, it's a higher standard than for the non-union uh, situation uh, because here union employees must have a good faith belief based on ascertainable objective evidence. Uh, now refusals to work over unsafe conditions in, in the union environment are not considered strikes for purposes of a no strike clause in a collective bargaining agreement. Um, but importantly, refusals to work by unionized employees uh, are, are, can be protected even if they're done by a solo employee because uh, in this context, the presence of the union is what uh, brings the concerted uh, part to the activity. Um, so uh, especially in, in, in this time of, of rising um, COVID uh, uh, caseloads, uh, what do you do if, an, if employees walk off the job? Uh, because of their their concerns about COVID and 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 their their employers' uh, prevention and mitigation methods. Uh, well, I can tell you one thing not to do, and it's not uh, to follow the example of of an employer uh, uh, who, in in late September, the NLRB uh, through an advice memorandum uh, um, uh, advised uh, and 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 gave the go ahead to. Uh, proceeding against uh, the employer uh, for violating the NLRA. In, in that case, a group of employees 
um, uh, they, they worked in like a food distributor company and a group of employees protested uh, the employer's failure to provide uh, personal protective equipment and, you know, things such as gloves and masks and hand sanitizers. Uh, and, and they also protested uh, the, um, uh, the employer's failure to, to set or enforce any sort of social distancing guidelines. Uh, and so the employees walked off the job and they, they, uh, they were off for two or three days without pay. Um, after several days, um, uh, they, they approached the employer, or at least the leaders did, and asked if, if they could return to work. And the employer said, yes, you may all return to work, except for you two, the two who were leaders uh, of, of your little walkout. Um, the board found uh, that, that that walkout was, was protect, protected concerted activity uh, and therefore approved the issuance of a, of a complaint in an unfair labor practice proceeding against that employer. So uh, if you do have this situation come up, uh, first thing, just keep your cool. <laughs> um, and, and I would say ask questions of the employees, um, engage in some dialogue with them to try to identify what they see uh, as, as you know, the unsafe condition. And in fact, what, what I suppose you're really trying to do is, is uh, plumb the depths of their their reasonable good faith belief um, and, and why they, they think the conditions are unsafe. But then uh, additionally, um, uh, and this goes with kind of keeping your cool, um, uh, don't get angry. Uh, resist the ur urge to terminate uh, or to discipline. Uh, and, and certainly don't, don't move forward with any discipline or termination, you know, uh, without consulting uh, outside labor law council. Sorry, that's a shameless plug for people who do what we do. Um, uh, Maggie, could I have the next slide, please? Um, let's move on to um, something that is is very 2020, uh, because obviously 2020 has brought a, a renewed focus on social justice issues. Um, uh, so let's let's spend a few minutes talking about social justice walkouts and strikes. Uh, Section seven, uh, again, section seven, you're gonna hear me say that a lot uh, through the rest of this. Um, section seven protection extends to concerted political activity when the subject matter of that advocacy has a direct nexus uh, to employees' interests uh, as employees. Uh, in other words, there needs to be a link between the political activity and the employee's terms and conditions of employment. Uh, next, please. Um, so let's look at, at a few recent examples. And the first of these uh, was back in February of 2017. There was uh, a, a day without immigrants protest. And this was a, a, a protest against the, the then uh, new Trump administration and uh, some, of, some of the immigration policies which it had announced. Um, uh, in this case, uh, the employer terminated 18 employees uh, for, for taking the day off and participating uh, in, in the, the protest march in, in, in their city. Um, it wasn't a surprise to the employer that the employees were going to do this. They had, they had uh, individually you know, given notice several days uh, before of their intent. Uh, well, the NLRB the NLRB addressed this also through through the, the mechanism of an advice memorandum. Uh, again, more more labor law esoterica, esoterica of which I'll spare you. Uh, but the the associate general counsel in that advice memorandum found that the employees' participation in day without immigrants, um, where they walked out walked off the job for a full day, uh, the board found that to be protected concerted activity uh, under the act. Um, the, the, the board's associate general counsel found that the protest uh, did indeed have a direct nexus to working conditions uh, because the general counsel said that aggressive immigration enforcement threatened the job security of unauthorized workers. And yes, unauthorized workers are protected by the NLRA. Um, and then likely also caused, uh, which in turn, 
uh, uh, jeopardized employment standards and working conditions uh, and, and could cause them to deteriorate for all workers. Uh, the board's theory was that unauthorized workers who fear uh, 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 deportation um, um, are not going to come forward and make complaints about, about anything that has to do with their terms and conditions of employment. Um, uh, Maggie, the next slide, please, because we'll look at a, a second example, uh, uh, a second recent example, uh, and that comes out of the Fight for 15 movement. Uh, uh, you may uh, remember a few years ago, this was a, a, a movement um, uh, which attempts to raise the minimum wage up to, to $15 an hour. Uh, in this case, the employee gave the employer a strike notice um, saying you know, that she was not gonna be at work the next day because she was attending a rally to demand $15 an hour as well as the right to join a union. Now, uh, in this case, the employee had a little help. Um, uh, she was a, a non-union employee. She was a, worked at a Papa John's pizza, but she was a paid union organizer. So uh, she kind of had the union backing her up and that's why she, she knew to do some of these uh, kind of inside baseball things like give her employer a strike notice. Um, uh, but uh, of course the, the uh, employer disciplined her for that and then she filed an unfair labor practice charge. Um, uh, the board's general counsel, again, through an advice memorandum, uh, found that the employee's activity, even though she had acted alone, uh, uh, that it was protected concerted activity and here, the direct nexus uh, to employee terms and conditions was, well, the obvious one, $15 uh, minimum wage. That certainly affects terms and conditions of employment. Uh, but also, uh, uh, the board found a direct nexus to, to advancing union rights for low-wage workers, and that's, that, of course, is also protected. Uh, so now the next slide, please. Um, let, let's look at a, a contrary example. Um, uh, to this where, I'm sorry, Maggie, could we, uh, the next slide, there we go. Um, uh, and, and this involves a, a very recent case. Um, again, it was an NLRB advice memo. And this one was, was just factually a little, a little strange. Uh, and so I don't know how universally applicable uh, this might be. But um, uh, in August of this year, the, the, the board issued this advice memo um, that advised that, that workers who advocate for political causes not directly tied to the workplace, uh, that that activity is not protected by the NLRA. Um, in this case, and this is what makes this more of an outlier, um, the employer was a union. The employer was the, the uh, United Food and Commercial Workers. Um, they fired one of their employees, an international representative, um, who took time off from work uh, to testify in support of police reform. Um, now, the employee did that in, in her capacity as a Maryland state delegate, which I guess is something in the Maryland legislature. I'm, I'm, I'm wholly ignorant of the state of Maryland. Uh, but um, uh, her advocacy had no connection to any employment concern of any employee. Uh, instead, the employee was acting in, in the interest of the community at large and in furtherance of, of her own political agenda. I mean, seemingly noble goals. Uh, but uh, the board found that, that the employee's termination uh, did not violate Section 7 because uh, the act does not protect employee political advocacy that has no nexus, no connection to a specifically identified employment concern. Uh, and so, Maggie, if we could go to the next slide, please. Let's, let's see what we can discern from, from some of these examples. Um, first off, it's not hard to create a nexus to terms and conditions of employment. Again, with terms and conditions of employing, employment being such a broad concept, I mean, all, all employees who are seeking to, to take time off to engage in a, in a protest you know, all they have to do is tie it to something having to do with employment. Maybe it's wage issues, maybe it's safety issues, maybe it's equal employment opportunity. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the list is, is endless. Uh, 
but but if you are faced with employees uh, who are uh, telling you that they're going to take time off to to participate in some type of social justice rally or or march or protest a, a critical question for for you to ask them or, or i guess your supervisors is what are you protesting uh, by asking them that question again you'll be trying to flesh out what is the direct nexus, or, or if there is a direct nexus to any term or condition of employment. Um, and, and, and I would also advise, you know, to the extent you get answers to that question, what are you protesting, uh, write them down, uh, document those answers, because um, uh, uh, you, you may need that down the road. Now, this is an area, I mean, employers need to tread very carefully when deciding whether to discipline or discharge for this type of activity. Um, and in these cases, and, and, and again, I, 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 I advise you know, consulting with labor law counsel, but I'll warn you in advance, it'll be a frustrating conversation with labor law counsel because these cases are very fact specific. Uh, there are no bright lines and, and they frequently turn on very facile distinctions, uh, but, but it's worth, uh, uh, you know, watching, watching uh, what steps you take, and it's worth consulting with counsel because the risks here can be significant. Uh, the employee can file an unfair labor practice charge with the NLRB, uh, and likewise, there's the, uh, the adverse publicity uh, angle. Um, you know, no one wants uh, Ed and Peggy Gallick uh, from uh, the, the, the Channel 8 I team uh, knocking on their front door and, and, and putting a microphone in your face about why you why you terminated these two dozen employees who were merely exercising their uh, uh, their rights to, to protest uh, uh, on behalf of, of whatever cause. Um, so um, so yeah, these are these are tough questions. Um, let's move now, Maggie, and to the next slide, please. Um, to a, a, another form of disruption, but it might be relatively low grade disruption compared to say someone walking off the job. Uh, and those are dress code issues. Uh, private sector employers, of course, have the right to regulate what employees wear to work. You know, some employers have, have require uniforms, others have policies that require professional appearance. Uh, others have other employers have policies that prohibit vulgar and obscene or, or offensive images. Um, private sector employers may ban political clothing uh, or display of political images or political messaging in the workplace. Now it needs to be enforced uniformly um, without favoritism or bias and uh, you might remember in, in, in the recent two or three months a, a, a very significant uh, Northeast Ohio employer uh, was in the news for this issue. Um, that's really not within the purview of, of this speech, so I, I'm, I'm not going to head down uh, down that road. Uh, but uh, next pl slide, please, Maggie. Um, uh, when addressing dress code issues, and, and when when I guess confronted by employees who may be wearing something uh, that that. Uh, has some uh, connection to terms and conditions of employment or, or unionization, uh, you need to be mindful of our old friend, Section 7, uh, um, because you want to be very careful about banning clothing or items which relate to terms and conditions of employment or unionization or other protected matters. Um, uh, for indeed, the, the Supreme Court of the United States, a very long time ago, back in 1945, uh, held that, that employees have the right to wear union insignia at work. And that phrase union insignia encompasses, you know, really anything having to do with terms and conditions of employment or unionization or, or other protected matters. Um, but employees have that right to wear that uh, material and display that material at work. Um, uh, it's a legitimate and, and reasonable form of union activity that's protected by the act. And the employer's curtailment of that right uh, clearly violates the NLRA. Uh, now, and next slide, please. There is an exception um, to that. The employer may restrict the wearing of union insignia where special circumstances justify the restriction. 
Now, that special circumstances exception really is, is recognized in four uh, distinct situations, and, and, and I'm not gonna, gonna go through those. They're, they're there on the slide, but um, uh, suffice to say, the, the employer has to prove the exception uh, by substantial evidence. It's a very heavy burden for an employer to meet. And, and looking at the next slide, we'll see um, a couple recent examples of, of employer attempts uh, 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 to argue special circumstances. And the first involved the California burger chain in and out Burger uh, in, a, in a case decided in, in just a couple years ago. Um, the restaurant maintained a very strict dress code policy that prohibited employees from wearing any type of button or pins or badges. Uh, and the employer's rationale, uh, seemingly sensible, was the, that the policy was necessary to, to reinforce the, the public image that, uh, that the restaurant was, was seeking to create. Um, there were two exceptions to uh, the, the no buttons and badges rule. Um, uh, a, a Christmas button, which uh, the employer issued at Christmas time for employees, uh, and then also at a different time of the year, um, a, a, the company had a charitable foundation which did fundraising in, in, at a certain time of year. So, in, in next slide, please. Um, uh, of course, our old friend Fight for 15 uh, comes back again in this case uh, because at, at the In and Out, at, at one of the In and Out burger locations in California, um, employees wore a wore the Fight for 15 badge on their uniforms. Uh, now, they were, they were very small badges. They were actually smaller than, than the size of the company's annual Christmas badge. Um, the company enforcing its policy, um, you know, ordered the employees to remove the badges, and the employees did, but then they marched down to the local office of the National Labor Relations Board and filed unfair labor practice charges. Um, it did not go well for the company before the board. Uh, because the board ruled that employees had the right to wear the badges even in customer facing situations. Uh, and, and the board found that the company did not prove any of the special circumstances needed uh, to sustain uh, its, its rule. Um, and so uh, next slide please. Let's uh, look at another even more recent case on dress code which actually uh, raises the interesting question of whether size matters. Uh, this involved Walmart. Uh, Walmart's uh, dress code limited, but did not prohibit uh, union insignia. Uh, instead, it, the Walmart policy was, it was content neutral, meaning people could wear badges or pins for whatever cause they wished. Um, but provided that, that the, the, the badges or pins had to be small and non-distracting logos or graphics, no larger than the size of the employee name badge. Now, um, all of us sometime or another are, are, are part of people of Walmart. Um, you know, a Walmart employee's uh, name badge is it's about the size of a credit card. So, you know, it's a fairly sizable um, uh, object that, that Walmart's policy was permitting. Um, the NLRB, liked or at least uh, uh, liked certain aspects of the Walmart policy because it found that Walmart's policy and its size limitation uh, did not violate Section 7, at least as it was applied uh, to areas of the store where employees encounter customers. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the customer floor, uh, as well as, you know, checkout areas and even the very front of the store with the, uh, with the Walmart greeters. Uh, Walmart was able to enforce its policy in those areas, but as to other areas of the store where, where there was no customer contact, um, the board found uh, Walmart's policy unlawful. Uh, so uh, finally, just in, uh, in, in the very brief time uh, I have left, uh, I, I, I just wanna touch on offensive speech in the workplace. Um, of course, First Amendment free speech rights um, don't apply in the private sector workplace. So the private sector employer, um, you know, may, may regulate and may punish for offensive speech, except of course, if that speech was connected to 
uh, activity protected by Section 7. Uh, and here I'll tell you, I think the board has a has historically been very forgiving of offensive, abusive, and even racist outbursts. And uh, the example uh, uh, I can give you is, and it's a very recent case um, uh, from uh, 2016. Um, uh, there was a, a, a manufacturing company uh, had a strike, and on the picket line. Um, uh, striking union employees uh, shouted the following at uh, replacement workers who were, were entering the plant that day. And, and the, many of the replacement workers were African-American. Uh, the statements were, uh, I smell fried chicken and watermelon, don't you boys? Um, hey, you N-words, did you bring enough fried chicken for us? That is offensive speech by any, any objective definition, and no employer in America should have to tolerate that. But the board for 70 years or more has said, well, that's okay. That's what happens on picket lines. Picket lines are kind of rough and tumble. Uh, and so in contexts like, um, like picket lines uh, or workplace discussions with management or, or also more recently social media posts, the board has been very forgiving uh, of, of, of offensive and abusive and, and, and racist and, and sexist outbursts. And so, uh, and, and the board has for many, many decades used a very high legal standard for that kind of behavior uh, uh, to be removed from the protection of Title VII. Uh, Maggie, next slide, please. Uh, well, uh, just a few months ago in July, uh, the, the NLRB recalibrated its approach to these cases in, in a case involving General Motors. Um, uh, and in this case, the board changed the standard for determining if, if employees are lawfully disciplined or discharged for offensive, abusive, or, or racist and sexist statements, in the, even if they're made in the course of protected Section 7 activity. Um, and and the, the, the new standard, it, it changes uh, some burdens of proof and, and burdens of production. Again, more labor law esoterica. Uh, but I'm sorry. Next slide, please. Uh, but but the the bottom line is that the General Motors decision makes it easier for employers to discipline or discharge employees who use offensive and abusive or racist or sexist speech in the workplace, even if it is connected to protected Section Seven activity. Uh, and in that way. Uh, the the uh, the board's General Motors decision finally, after many decades, uh, brings the NLRB uh, in line with the EEOC in fighting uh, this type of, of of discriminatorily unlawful speech in the workplace. So, uh, I apologize. Of, uh, I apologize for my technical difficulties, which I think caused me to run over a little bit. But I would now like to hand the baton to. Uh, Ray Tarasik, who's going to uh, talk about Ohio's new COVID-19 immunity law. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. So I think we're all set here. So um, again, Todd, thank you. I uh, just want to let everybody know that we are very mindful of your time, very respectful of your time. So I'm going to run through, through this very, very quickly. Hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes uh, to do some live questions. Uh, and answers to any one of our panel members. Uh, but I want to start and talk about Ohio's new COVID immunity statute uh, signed by Governor DeWine uh, September 15th of 2020. goes into effect in December, December 16th of this year. Uh, how do we get here on, on this immunity statute? Uh, started back in the spring, uh, there was a bill in the House, bill in the Senate, uh, Civil Justice uh, Committee in the House had House Bill 606. Uh, Senate Judiciary Committee had Senate Bill 308, and uh, there were some significant differences be between the two as they were making their way uh, through committees. Uh, differences talking about whether the, the permanency of the particular immunities, uh, what the, the standard of, of care, what the duty was going to be. Uh, as Jason mentioned, there was even some issues as far as workers' comp is concerned, uh, if the, uh, the uh, uh, COVID was contracted in, in the workplace. Um, this went through, through both, uh, both the, the House and the Senate. Uh, throughout most of the spring uh, into the beginning of early summer. Um, there, was, uh, there was nobody, I think, that worked harder 
uh, to to help get this uh, this uh, these bills uh, through and, and become law than than Calfrey's own uh, Senator John Eklund, who is the uh, the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, and uh, we actually did a, a, a roundtable discussion with two other of my colleagues, uh, Matt Mendoza and uh, Mike Van Buren, back in June. You can see that on the Calfrey website. They talk about some of the issues that were going on at that time, some of the struggles, uh, and some of the the concerns that they had both in the House and in the Senate. Uh, that is on the Calfee website if you're interested in seeing how, how we got here. But here we are, uh, and we're here with uh, the, the new immunity statute. Uh, and if I'm going to try and get through some of these uh, slides here, they, they affect both healthcare providers and there's a general immunity. So it's for, for healthcare providers and the services that they provide. And then there's a general immunity for essentially everybody else for businesses, for schools, government entities, religious entities. Uh, and we'll talk first of all about the healthcare providers, the important parts here. Uh, it is a temporary uh, immunity. There are uh, exceptions to the, the, the immunity, uh, and there are some limitations. And the qualified immunity limits it just to uh, services that are provided during a declared disaster. And they talk about the declared disaster being that executive order back in March that was signed by, uh, by the governor, uh, declaring a state of emergency uh, here in Ohio. And this is really for the services that are provided by healthcare providers. There was a lot of talk during, uh, during uh, committee hearings uh, by a number of healthcare providers, a number of people that were receiving benefits from healthcare providers, uh, about uh, about what was going on at that time when people really didn't know, and we we still don't really know. Uh, but at that point in time, what we can all remember, it was it was really uh, there were really a lot of unknowns going on, and uh, uh, some of the issues they were talking about that that that, uh, that uh, are being uh, provided this immunity are for for actions or omissions. Uh, that, that are done by decisions that are being made by those healthcare providers, uh, and and with respect to, to compliance with with executive orders, um, the other uh, uh, temporary immunity uh, uh, is uh, from being unable to to uh, treat a person due to an executive order uh, or a director's order. There are exceptions here, uh, and this gets back to what we were talking about with the standard standard of care. Uh, the, the exceptions for these services, uh, uh, the exceptions to the immunity are whether or not the, if a conduct was considered to be reckless disregard, a reckless conduct or intentional, willful, wanton conduct. And the statute dis describes what reckless uh, disregard is, which is a, a heedless indifference to the consequences of, of those particular actions that, that you take. And again, this was very important because at one point in time, there were discussions both in the, uh, the Senate and the House uh, on having a negligence, a much lower bar. Uh, to to have to to have to cross uh, to uh, to get out of this particular kind of a, of immunity, and it also excludes conduct out. Oh, we went back here. Excludes conduct outside of, of the skills uh, or training. Um, some limitations on this. Uh, limitations are it doesn't create a new uh, uh, cause of action. Uh, there are limitations on prohibiting a class action. Uh, for any of these particular claims. And again, it's limited from the executive order that the governor had uh, back in March of 2020 uh, through September 30th of 2021. So that's taking us all the way into the, uh, into the better part of, of next year. Uh, talk a little bit now about the general immunity, and this goes for everybody else, for businesses, schools, governmental entities. And again, this is a temporary law. It is a temporary law uh, that uh, prohibits bringing a lawsuit uh, for injury, death, or loss that is caused by exposure or transmission uh, or contraction of, and it specifically sets out what those particular uh, uh, issues are. MERS, SARS, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is the, the, uh, the uh, uh, disease that causes COVID-19. Uh, and again, it negates the immunity for reckless conduct or intentional, willful, uh, or wanton uh, misconduct. Prohibits class action uh, uh, issues. This is probably one of the most important parts here is that the government orders or recommendations do not create a duty of care. Uh, there's not a specific duty of care. Matter of fact, uh, the government orders and the recommendations not only do not present a specific new duty of care, uh, but they also are inadmissible uh, in, in court proceedings to try and establish whether or not uh, there was that, that uh, duty of care, whether or not that, that duty of care was, was indeed breached. Again, time period, March 9th, through September 30th. Um, that is a very, very, very quick uh, rendition of the immunity statute. Uh, open to any questions on that. I'm gonna uh, throw it back to Jen uh, to see if we have got some questions that are in the queue here 
for uh, any of our panel members. Sure. Um, thank you, Ray. Thanks everyone for presenting. For those of you that have to um, hop off, please be assured that your CLE is taken care of and dropping off before the Q&A will not affect your CLE in any way. So thank you everyone for participating. I know we are right at 1030. Um, but there were a few questions that I was going to address and then um, if any of the other panelists kind of have a few. Um, so there was a common question received that was, uh, hey, someone is quarantining in precaution because they were exposed to a person that's positive for COVID-19. Can't they go get a test? And if they're negative, come back to work. Um, that's a really, really common misperception. Um, the answer is no. Uh, the exposed individual should isolate for 14 days, um, and that is because the virus can manifest in someone who's exposed between two and 14 days. So while most symptoms will occur um, around the five or six day mark, which is probably what people have heard, um, they can manifest all the way up to that 14 days. So if an employee gets a negative test on day five, six, seven, they could still develop COVID-19 um, up to day 14. And so that's why an exposed employee should be requested to self-isolate for 14 days, regardless of a negative test. The testing return to work protocol is uh, only applicable to a person who is COVID positive. And so if someone's COVID positive, then and two negative consecutive respiratory sample tests can act as a way to return to work. But again, as of last week, that methodology was disfavored by um, the CDC. So, so it's a very narrow exception and it's for individuals who are positive for COVID-19, not for those isolating because of exposure. Um, the other one, I thought this was, this was a good clarification. Uh, do employers really have to do the contact tracing? Isn't that the role of the health department? So the short answer is yes, contact tracing in quotes is the role of the health department and uh, should be done as a public health matter. So what we're talking about when we say contact tracing is really different um, in the respect that it only relates to the employer's effort to exclude potentially COVID exposed or COVID positive work workers from your workplace. Um, you certainly are not required to delve into the personal life of your employee and then notify personal contacts. You are only interested in keeping COVID out of your workspace. So by finding out who they were exposed to, um, other employees, customers, contractors, vendors, then you'll be able to have individuals who were exposed in your workplace um, stay home and isolate and stay out of your physical space to protect other employees and to prevent the spread um, among your employees. So that's what we were talking about when we mentioned contact trace. Um, and so I think those were the most common questions. The rest of them we did, let's see, we have a couple more coming in. Um, let's see. Okay. I don't know if Jason, I saw that you answered a few. Did you have any that you wanted to address for the group? Yeah, one, one of the questions was, um, sorry, no, I don't know what happened here. If you, um, can you hear me still? Yes. I don't know what's going on? Yes. Um, one of the questions was if you state that's, uh, if you take the hybrid approach to, to vaccination, and state that some employees um, are required to, to get the vaccine and some not, is that going to, to raise uh, issues of discrimination? And I agree that it, it might raise um, questions of, of discrimination, but it, it, what I'm talking about is not requiring it for, um, you know, employees over age 65 or requiring it for employees who have certain medical conditions like diabetes. That, that would be unlawful based on age and, and disability. What I'm talking about is um, based on what the employees do or where th those employees, the work environment where they work, can you treat them differently based on those concerns? And those are, uh, can be legitimate justifications. Um, 
the, uh, for example, I, I use the example of, you know, production employees where it's difficult, you have to work together oftentimes in teams, it's difficult to distance versus office employees. You know, that's the, the most obvious distinction. So, um, you know, I'm thinking warehouse employees versus, you know, truck drivers, where the drivers you may not have to require because they're most of the time during the workday, they're alone by themselves driving. Um, so as long as there's a legitimate justification for making those distinctions, um, you can do so without it being um, unlawful discrimination. And, and the key is to treat, um, quote, similarly situated employees, um, those in the same positions, same, same types of duties, same types of work environment, treat those types of employees similarly. Um, the one thing I also I wanna note is that um, if you have this neutral policy um, for some employees, you should still be aware of, of potential disparate impact claims. So if you have a neutral policy that says um, only employees in a certain department um, are required to get, to get the vaccine, if those employees in, in that department are largely made up of, you know, a, a group of employees in a protected class, for example, um, minority employees, female employees, then you might get, it has to be, I think it has, the number does have to be large in order for it to be, you know, statistically sufficient, but um, there you might raise claims of this neutral policy, although not intentionally discriminatory, has a disparate impact on um, people of a, of a certain class. So you have to be aware of that as well. I think, I think that's it. Okay. Um, thanks, Jason. We had a couple additional questions um, from my presentation. An employee's spouse um, was exposed to COVID and the health department asked that, that person to quarantine, but the employee uh, who was not exposed, just had the exposed spouse, um, could come back to work. You know, is this okay? And um, yes, yeah, so, so if the only person who's required to isolate is the person who is exposed, so you don't um, you don't have to exclude from the workplace someone who is exposed at a second level, um, that second level of potential exposure. So um, yes, if say you know John is married to Sally and Sally was around someone who has COVID and has to quarantine for 14 days, then John can still come to work, uh, but should carefully monitor for symptoms, so should Sally. And if Sally starts showing any symptoms, then knowing that she was exposed to COVID, John should not come to work that day or as soon as Sally starts showing symptoms. You would treat her as a COVID presumed positive until she was able to get a test or other diagnosis saying that it was um, definitively not. COVID. Um, okay, and general, uh, do we have to notify the health department if an employee presents a verification of a positive test? Typically not. This may vary county to county, city to city. So, so some of this is variable for those of you on the line. I know there's a lot of different localities, but typically the, um, the medical provider that uh, find, that determines the test is positive is the one notifying the health department. Um, so typically not, the, the positive test will be reported to the health department and that's how the health department gets notified. It's not generally the employer's responsibility. All right, and I think that's it. Thank you all so much uh, for attending today and participating. Um, we will be posting the recording this afternoon, I'm told, and so this will be available on our website. Um, thanks again and take care. Everyone, what?